Hello and welcome to this Electrical Principles training video. In this video, we're going to continue our research into the fluorescent lamp and figuring out what was going on with the voltages and the currents inside it. In previous videos, we've solved the mystery of how we appear to have more voltage inside the fitting than we had being applied to it. In this video, we're going to have a look at what's happening with those currents. Because if you remember from our original video, the mystery of the fluorescent lamp, when we turned the uh, capacitor in the circuit on and off, although we were introducing more current into the circuit, the current actually fell. Let's just cut back to that footage to remind ourselves what it looks like. Okay, so this is how much current is flowing into the circuit. So we can see on our drawing that the current flowing into the circuit and the current flowing through the lamp and the choke are exactly the same. Now, it's quite interesting at this stage because what we're going to do now is we're going to introduce the capacitor into the circuit. Now, the capacitor is going to draw some current through it. And therefore, we'd expect, because it's connected in parallel with the circuit, we'd expect however much current is flowing through the capacitor to simply be added onto this value here. So currently, flowing into the circuit, we've got uh, 0.6, let's have a look here, so that's 0. 0.6. 7, and this is split into 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 divisions. So that's going to be 0 0.64 of an amp, roughly. So we've got 0 0.64 amps flowing into the circuit. Okay. What we're going to do now is go over to our power factor correction capacitor, and we're going to introduce that into the circuit and have a look at what that reading is. So if we could perhaps move the camera over to the uh, power factor correction capacitor, so this ammeter over on this side is going to tell us how much current is flowing into the power factor correction capacitor. Okay. So at the minute, it's disconnected from the circuit. There is absolutely no current flowing through there. So what we'll do is we'll switch the power factor correction capacitor on and we'll see just exactly uh, how much current is going to be uh, flowing into them. Okay, so that's about as comfortable as we're going to get with that needle. So if we have a look here, we're getting 0 0.6, just over 0 0.6 again, we're sort of 0 0.63 there. So now we've got 0 0.63 amps flowing into the circuit that's being drawn by the capacitor. So we might rationally expect that the current flowing through the choke and the lamp and the current flowing through the capacitor at the point where they meet in the circuit, we'd expect them just to join together and give us the total circuit current. So we'd be talking somewhere around 1.2, 1.3 amps if we were to add those two values together. However, if we bring the camera back over to our ammeter that is measuring the total current flowing into the circuit, we'll see that something interesting has happened over here. So can you see what's happened to the current flowing into the circuit? We've actually reduced it. So now we've got 0 0.39 maybe three nine amps flowing into the circuit now. So somehow by connecting this capacitor into the circuit, which is drawing current, so we've not changed anything here, we can see that we're actually now drawing less current into the circuit than we were before. So somehow adding more current into the circuit has reduced the amount of current that the circuit is using. So you can clearly see from that footage that when we introduced the capacitor into the circuit, it started to draw current into the circuit. But we saw that in total, the current flowing into the fluorescent light fitting as a whole actually reduced. So how can that be? How can it be that drawing more current within the circuit actually leads to less current flowing into the circuit? Well, again, we can explain this by using our phasor diagrams. So let's have a look at our original drawing from a previous video. So this is how we left our circuit diagram of the fluorescent light in a previous video. You can see there that we've got the voltages being clearly shown out of phase across the lamp and across the choke. Uh, the voltage across the lamp being represented by VR because that's the resistive part of the circuit. And the voltage across the choke being represented by VL because that is the inductive part of the circuit. Now you'll notice on this drawing that there's no capacitor connected. So we don't have a capacitor in circuit at the moment. So let's fill that in the drawing now. So you can see clearly there's our capacitor. Now let's have a look at what's actually happening here. So we've got our 
phasor diagrams for the resistive part of the load and the inductive part of the load. And you can see there that for those we used the current as the reference phasor. The reason for that is that those two elements combined to form a series circuit, which means that the current flowing through there was constant. However, now you can see that the capacitor has been connected in parallel. Now, you could achieve a similar effect by connecting the capacitor in series with those other two loads, but in practical terms, it can lead to one or two problems. And so the capacitor gets connected in parallel. Now, what that means is that if we compare the phasor diagram for the capacitor to the phasor diagram that we created for the resistive and inductive part of the circuit, what that means is that we actually need to modify our original phasor diagram a little bit. And that's because now we're considering what's happening with the voltage and the current inside the capacitor. But of course, we've got it connected in parallel. So that means that we're no longer going to use the current as the reference phasor. We're now going to use the voltage as the reference phasor. So what we're going to do is we're going to rotate our original phasor diagram a little bit. And you can see there that it's rotated round so that now the supply voltage, the total voltage flowing into the circuit is our reference phasor. Now the reason for that will become clear in a moment. So now let's have a think about what our phasor diagram for our capacitor is going to look like. So we're going to use the voltage as the reference phasor and if you remember back to the videos where we looked at uh, the leading and lagging nature of capacitive and inductive loads and filled in our worksheet, You'll remember that in a capacitive circuit, the current leads the voltage. So what that means is if we draw the voltage as a horizontal arrow, and bear in mind that arrow will just be the same length as the supply voltage because whatever voltage we're applying to the circuit is being applied to the capacitor because it's in parallel. You can see there that the voltage is horizontal for the capacitor and the current, where will that be pointing if it's leading? well, it will point directly up, won't it, at 90 degrees to our voltage arrow. And of course, that means that the current is leading the voltage. Now, if you're not sure about these expressions that I'm using, leading and lagging, then please go back and watch at least the summary video for AC theory, where we made sure that our worksheet was completely filled in. So now this starts to get really interesting when we now combine our capacitor phasor diagram with our phasor diagram for our original circuit with the lamp and the choke connected in series. So we'll bring that down and we will lay that phasor diagram from our capacitor on top of our original phasor diagram. Now you can see, just like with the currents in the previous video, we don't need to add the two voltages together because they are the same. The voltage applied to the circuit is the voltage applied to the capacitor. But now notice what's happened with our current. We've now got a current arrow, the current flowing into the capacitor, pointing directly upwards on our phasor diagram. So now we're back to an interesting situation. You can see there that our current flowing into the capacitor and the current flowing into the rest of the circuit, which we will now call IRL, because it is the current flowing into the resistive and inductive part of the circuit, you can see that those two have fallen out of phase with each other. Now, we can show what happens when those two currents combine. If you remember in the voltages video, it's like if you imagine a little uh, object at the point where the two current arrows meet, uh, and imagine that it's got two forces on it, one trying to drag it off down to the right and one trying to drag it straight up, what's going to happen to that object? Well, it's going to get kind of dragged off to the right a little bit, isn't it? And actually what we can do is we can map out exactly which direction that object would move in and effectively how far it would move. Now we're not dealing with a moving object, we're dealing with currents, but the principle stays the same. When those two currents meet at the point where the capacitor joins the circuit, they join together and they have an effect on each other. They have kind of an influence on each other and they kind of modify each other so that when they join in the current that's flowing into the circuit, they've actually become slightly different. Now we can do that by mapping our parallel lines to the two currents. So let's do that now. Let's draw a parallel line to the current that flows into the resistive and inductive part of the circuit. So we'll draw a parallel line there. So that's following parallel to that one. And then we will draw a parallel line from the end of the resistive and inductive current that 
is parallel to the capacitive current, so it goes directly up like that. Now, do you remember the important point? Where those two lines cross, if we draw a new arrow from the point where the two lines cross to the point where the two arrows originally uh, met each other, we can see there that we get a new arrow that represents current. And what do you think that arrow represents? Well, of course, it represents the combining of those two currents, which means that it represents the amount of current that's flowing into the circuit. Now, the critical point, the really interesting point, is look at what's happened to the length of that arrow. Can you see that when we didn't have the capacitor connected, the arrow was a certain length, but now we've connected the capacitor and those two currents have combined and affected each other, we can see that the new current flowing into the circuit has actually been reduced. So now there is literally less current flowing into the circuit than there was before. And that explains why when we uh, measured our currents in the previous video, we saw that when you connect the capacitor into the circuit, even though it's drawing current into the circuit, the current as a total actually reduces. It's because the current flowing through the resistive and inductive part of the circuit and the current flowing through the capacitor are out of phase with each other. So there we have it. We've solved the mystery of the fluorescent lamp. We now know why the voltages were adding up to more voltage than we were applying to the circuit. We found how drawing more current into the circuit seemed to reduce the amount of current flowing into the circuit. We now understand that a little bit better than we did before, thanks to our understanding of AC theory and those phasor diagrams that we drew. Now, one of the amazing things about our understanding of this process is if you think about the original video that we shot on this, where we were turning the capacitor in and out of the circuit, and therefore reducing the current flowing into the lamp, the operation of the lamp didn't change. It stayed at the same brightness. So we were actually getting the same light output for less current. And if we're drawing less current into the circuit, that means we were using less power. Now what we've touched on here is we've kind of started to dig away at the surface of a subject called power factor correction. Now this is something that you may well have heard about and hopefully it's something that you might already know a little bit about. What we're going to do in the ongoing series of these videos is we're going to dig into power factor in a little bit more depth because it's a really important subject. It can save us an awful lot of running costs, an awful lot of energy, and therefore is an important thing to carry out and understand. So we'll look at that over the following videos to come. However, before we get to that, there's some more information that we can draw out of our studies of this fluorescent lamp and AC theory. So we're going to continue on to look at things like impedance, different kinds of power, and that all-important power factor. So we've got some really exciting stuff coming up. So all that remains to say in this video is, thank you very much for watching.